Hello, and welcome to Character Forge, the show where I walk you through the work of crafting an interesting tabletop RPG character. My name is Tyler Owens, I'll be your character smith today, and joining me is my wife, Lee, who will be drawing our character as we go. For her sake, I'm going to choose up front that I'm making a female elf character. I was reading through the Unearthed Arcana the other day, which, if you don't know, is the playtest material for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and I came across a couple of things that I thought would be cool to combine. The first of the Unearthed Arcana that caught my eye comes from the Gothic Heroes article. It is a sub-race that can be applied to any player race called the Revenant. The idea of the Revenant is that your character has died, but has died in such a way that they come back, whether for revenge or some other unfinished business, as an undead being hell-bent on completing their task so they can finally enter eternal rest. Uh, revenants come back to life after 24 hours when they're killed, they get a plus one to their constitution score, and they always know the direction and distance to any creature related to their goal. This got my mind worrying. I wanted to figure out a revenant, but what class to go with? Well, that's when the second Unearthed Arcana came in. In an article entitled Three Subclasses from January of 2018, there are, surprise, surprise, three new subclass options. The School of Invention for Wizards, the Brute for Fighters, and, pertinent to our, cla uh, to our character here, the Circle of Spores for Druids. The flavor behind the Circle of Spores is the idea of fungal zombies, in which corpses are reanimated by fungal infestations. It's perhaps a less common zombie trope, but a fun one nonetheless. When I saw this class option, I knew right away that I wanted to make a Revenant Circle of Spores druid. The idea of the fungus that is used in the druid's necromancy being the same fungus that is keeping the druid alive as a Revenant just resonated with me. So let's see what we can do with that idea. Uh, quick aside, while I was coming up for the concept of this character, I got the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica book, which contains the non-playtest version of the Circle of Spores, so we'll be using that version of the class for this build. The differences are pretty minor, but it's a little better balanced, so I just thought I'd bring that up. Uh, we'll start by rolling up stats. I like rolling for stats, it just seems more fun than either point by or standard values. For those of you unfamiliar with how to roll for stats in 5th edition, what you do is you roll 4d6, 4 standard 6-sided dice. Then you take the three largest values and add them together. The lowest value die doesn't matter. This gives you a number between 3, if you are ridiculously unlucky, but it did happen to me once, and 18. This number will be one of your six ability scores. Do this five more times and you're set to assign your scores. So here we go. Let's see if you can hear that rattling. Uh, let's see. Looks like our first roll is a 16. That's a pretty good start. Our next roll, a 14. All right. Our next roll, ooh, ah, there it is, a 9. That's all right. Negative modifiers are great role play material. Uh, let's see, what do we got? Uh, yes, another 16. Okay, we like, we like high numbers, high numbers. Uh, 15, that's solid. One more to go, and really, a 7. Now you know how I feel. <laughs> okay, I guess the dice were really good to me otherwise. I can take two negative modifiers. I mean, I am dead after all. I'll probably make constitution and strength the dump stats. It's a bit weird, now that I think of it, that revenants have increased constitution. Like, I guess they'd be better at resisting poison, being dead and all. And they are really hard to kill in that they can't be, at least not permanently, without helping them accomplish their goal. And I guess it makes sense, but we'll make con and strength the dump stats all the same. Uh, so we've got a 16, a 14, a 9, a 16, a 15, and a 7. It's a little too many odd numbers for my taste, since modifiers increase at even numbers, and you get an even number of points to increase when you hit certain levels. Odd numbers kind of feel like a waste, but this will work. Uh, let's see. Like I said, we're going to go with Elf for the main race. I know, an Elf Druid is kind of a cliche, but it works, so I'm going to go with it. That means that in addition to the plus one I get to constitution, I'll get a plus two to dexterity. Uh, so let's 
assign those stats. Uh, I've already said I'm making con and strength my dump stats, so I'll put the 7 into, into constitution, which will bump up to an 8 uh, with the revenant bonus, and the 9 into strength, so that both of them are at a minus 1 modifier. Uh, let's see, we'll put the 15 into intelligence and the 14 into charisma, because while apparently I'm a sexy zombie, I am a zombie, so I should probably have lower charisma than intelligence. Also, yes, I know charisma is not directly related to sexiness, it's just a funny joke. Uh, I'm gonna correlate her breast size with charisma, so just saying. Okay, yeah. Um, also, I have to say, I mean... Zombies aren't techni technically also aren't typically the brightest, so maybe I should put intelligence lower, but eh, we'll go with this. I mean, they, they're the same modifier, and I'm unlikely to increase either, so it doesn't really super matter which goes to which. Uh, that leaves a 16 for wisdom, my spellcasting stat as a druid, and an 18 for dex when we factor in the elven bonus. That will work out for us, since the Circle of Spores has several abilities that only have a range of 10 feet, so I'll want to have a high dex to be able to be in the thick of things fighting with a finesse weapon. Uh, let's see. I think it's high time that we give our druid a name. Characters need names. Not stupid zombies. Anyway. <laughs> uh, in, in case you uh, are wondering... Lee has, has a bit of a thing against the undead. Their experience points on legs. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Let's call her... Uh, let's see, get some ideas from, from the player's handbook. Uh, let's, uh, elven names tend to have a lot of vowels in them, so let's call her Inalia. L-I-A, yeah. Uh, Inalia, uh, last names, see, I, one thing that you might not know about me, uh, is I'm kind of a sucker for languages, uh, so I really like the, uh, the fact that they give us translations for the elven last names in, in the 5th edition ha player's handbook, uh, so let's look here, uh, let's go with Inalia Amasian, which would be Inalia Brookflower, um, while we're on the subject of giving her a name, I guess now is as good a time as any to choose her background. Let's see. Flip through the background. Uh, okay. Okay, how about this for the backstory? Uh, Inalia's first memory was of the moment right before her death. A figure she assumes must have been her mentor in the druidic arts looked down on her with sad eyes and said, I'm so sorry. It should have been me, before plunging a dagger into her heart. As she lay dying, he took a box from a stump behind him and sprinkled its contents, luminous spores, over her. He told her to take the spores to the Genesis Ark, and all went black. The next thing she knew, she had awoken as a revenant. From this, uh, I think there are about three options that stand out to me from the backgrounds in the player's handbook. She could be a hermit or a sage from her time with the druids, or she could be an outlander from her time as a revenant. I think I'm going to go with sage for her, whatever reason, it just feels correct. Uh, from sage, we get proficiency in arcana and history. We also gain two additional languages that we'll figure out a little later. Right, so back to where Inalia is at the start of whatever campaign she'd be in. Her immediate reaction to awakening as a revenant with the memory of her death is to reject the mission given to her by this unnamed man. What the hell does she care about a Genesis Ark? She doesn't even know what that is, let alone where to find it. And even if she did, would she really want to fulfill the wishes of the man who had murdered her? He said he was sorry, bullcrap. This leaves her needing to find another purpose with her unlife. After some trial and error, figuring out that she could not be destroyed, she decided that she could that she would share the gift of unlife with as many beings as she could. If others are also prematurely cut down, why shouldn't they get the chance for a second life that she got? To her great pleasure, she found that she could share the spores that had animated her with the recently deceased and raise them to unlife as she was. But it wasn't exactly as she was. The people she raised did not retain their intelligence like she had. This is a problem that she could work on, were it not for the other problem. Creatures reanimated by her spores did not last. After one hour, they crumble into moldy dust. Why? 
Why did the spores refuse to let her die, but not save others? She's been searching for the answer to this question for some time. She doesn't even know how long. She's long since stopped counting the years. This is where she would enter the adventure, and the obvious hook for her would be the possibility of learning more about her spores, but I could see other good hooks, perhaps a hint at more information about who she was before she was murdered, and leave that to the DM. Uh, let's see. With that, uh, let's fill in some personality traits. Uh, the personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws, those are the four main things that a uh, character sheet asks you to fill out about your character. Uh, for personality traits, uh, we'll start with her being caring, as seen by her desire to save others from an untimely end, as well as a bit reckless, centuries of knowing that she could not die will do that to a person. As for her ideal, I think she'd say that an individual's duty is to affect the most good while doing the least harm. Her bond is obviously the charge to bring the spores to the Genesis, Genesis arc, and her flaw, aside from being reckless, would be that she is hyper-resistant to being commanded. Best not to take her when talking to a king or other nobility. Okay, uh, where are we at next? Uh, let's go back to some mechanical stuff. What proficiencies should Analia have uh, with this background uh, that we've given her? Uh, let's see. As an elf, we get proficiency in perception. And we already have Arcana in history from being a sage. So let's see. As a druid... We get to pick two proficiencies from Arcana, Animal Handling, Insight, Medicine, Nature, Perception, Religion, and Survival. Since I already have Arcana and Perception, I think it makes the most sense to take Insight. I mean, after being murdered, she's taken great pains to be able to read people. And you know what? Let's go with Medicine. I don't know how many people want a fungal revenant binding up their wounds, but she does have training in that from her previous life, and that could lead to some fun roleplay scenarios. Uh, let's see. We also get proficiency in intelligence and wisdom saving throws. Uh, okay, to go any further in the mechanical building of the character, we got to choose what level we want to start at. Um, I think I'm going to build Analia at level 6, mainly because she gets an important animate dead feature from the Circle of Spores at that level. Uh, so we'll go through the Druid and see what we get. Uh, at level 1, we get Druidic as another language, and since we've got a language here, let's go ahead and pick our other languages. Uh, we know Common and Elven from being an Elf, and we get two more from being a Sage. Let's go with Sylvan from her time with the Druids, and you know what? Let's let's go with Orc. Uh, apparently, she spent a lot of time with a particular Orc tribe as she studied their shaman, studied with their shamans to understand her spores. Didn't really get her anywhere, but it was a nice time, nice enough time. There were some there were some good people. They didn't make good zombies either. Yeah, no. Uh, let's see. At first level, we also get spell casting. Uh, so druids, druids are one of those great spellcaster classes that don't have to worry about what spells they know. They have access to all of the spells they can cast. They just have to choose which ones to prepare each morning. Uh, at sixth level, we'll have three cantrips as well as four first level spell slots, three second level spell slots, and three third level spell slots. We can prepare a number of spells per day equal to our wisdom modifier, uh, which would be three, plus our druid level. Since, spoiler alert, we're going to be taking an increase to Analia's wisdom at fourth level. Oh yeah, that's right. It'll be plus four to wisdom, uh, meaning at sixth level we can prepare ten spells per day. I'm sorry, so what's the wisdom going up to? Uh, at fourth level, wisdom would be going up to eighteen. Actually, that doesn't really make that big of a difference in drawing, but I'm still going <sighs> to you. Okay. Um... So yeah, at 6th level we can prepare 10 spells per day. We'll worry about which spells we have prepared in a little bit. Uh, at 2nd level we get the Wild Shape ability, which uh, is Druid's ability to transform into beasts. Uh, as well as we get two abilities from our Circle of Spores subclass. Halo of Spores and Symbiotic Entity. 
Halo of Spores lets us use our reaction to deal necrotic damage to a creature on a failed constitution saving throw when it enters or starts its turn within 10 feet of us. The damage scales with level, and at 6th level it deals 1d6 damage. Symbiotic Entity allows us to use our Wild Shape feature to gain temporary hit points, deal extra damage with Halo of Spores, and deal extra poison damage on our weapon strikes. Uh, essentially, instead of using your Wild Shape to transform into a beast, you, your, the spores kind of coat you and make you like a super zombie, I guess. Uh, since we've already mentioned our ability score improvement at 4th level, and 3rd and 5th level just give us access to more spells, we can move right on to our 6th level improvement, which is also from our circle, Fungal Infestation. This feature allows us to use our reaction when a beast or humanoid of medium or small size dies within 10 feet of us to animate it as a zombie with one hit point for one hour. Uh, so that's where, you know, why I wanted to start at level 6, because that point to the backstory of her the things that she raises never lasting that comes from this fungal infestation uh feature uh all right i guess uh let's move on to spells uh with our spell casting stat is wisdom uh mean and our proficiency bonus at level six being plus three that means our spell save DC is going to be 15, and spell attack modifier is going to be plus 7. For our, thi three, yeah, for our three cantrips, I think we'll take Shillelagh to have more me melee combat proficiency. Uh, Shillelagh lets you take a quarter staff or club and uh, basically imbue it with magical energy so that it does more damage uh, and... Um, it like it lets you it makes the damage of the weapon a d8 if it's less than a d8 um and also lets you uh use your spell casting modifier for attack rolls if you want to um then we'll take thorn whip uh which i think we're going to reskin to be kind of like a gross fungus whip uh so that we can pull creatures close enough to us to use our spore effects uh, Thorn Whip lets you pull creatures that you hit with it, I think, 10 feet closer to you. Uh, and for one more cantrip for a druid, let's take Poison Spray. I mean, we are a zombie. That just seems... A zombie with spores that we're killing people with. So that just seems appropriate. Uh, let's see. From our circle, we always have Blindness and Deafness, Gentle Repose, Animate Dead, and Gaseous Form prepared, and they don't count against our 10 spells. Uh, so now we just have to choose 10 more spells to have prepared. For our third level spells, uh, I think we're going to prepare Dispel Magic. I think uh, the circle that Inalia was a part of uh, saw anything other than druid magic as a, you know, unnatural blight on the world. So they would have taught their druids how to uh, sense and destroy other magics b uh, beyond druid craft. Um, so we'll go with dispel magic. Uh, we'll go with feign death. I mean, she's a zombie, so that's just kind of the kind of spell that she would have, I think. Um, and... Oh, I gotta go with this one. Meld with stone. I can just see her walking up to a wall and the spores melding onto the stone and her kind of just evaporating into the into the stone. Uh, so let's see. We have seven slots left for second and first level spells. Uh, let's see. Uh, for second level, let's prepare bark skin for additional help with running into melee. I mean, with our dexterity score, I think it's only going to add one to our AC, but... Uh, every bit of AC helps. Um, let's see, uh, we'll do Flame Blade, uh, for when Shillelagh just isn't enough damage output for us in the thick of things. That's the Flaming Scimitar one. Yeah. That's a cool spell. Um, and let's also take Animal Messenger. We'll give it a bit of a, you know, we'll have, we'll have the idea of those funguses that can like take over ant brains and like make them into basically real life fungus zombies it's kind of terrifying honestly but this this will be more of a like friendly kind of fungal mind control where after the mess uh, after the animal gives its message it's just it the fungus just decides to leave because technically speaking animal messenger is not supposed to kill the animal afterwards I think 
keep making this horrified face at you. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, then for first level spells, we'll prepare uh, Cure Wounds um, because of, you know, her training in medicine and also again it's just funny do do you really want a fungus zombie curing your wounds I'm just imagining that she does it by approaching you and giving you a gentle kiss on the forehead yeah probably something like that um detect magic again because her circle is all about getting rid of non-druid craft magic non-natural magic uh we'll take fairy fire uh fairy fire lets you uh, essentially make any everything in a certain area glow uh, it's to deal you know with invisible stuff and, and things like that um and if i'm not mistaken does fairy fire uh is, is fairy fire the one that makes oh no that's moonbeam never mind yeah, fairy um fire just lights up people. yeah fairy fire just lights up people yeah, uh, I th uh, along those lines, I actually think I would uh, reskin Fairy Fire to be casting out a cloud of spores that lightly coat the area. I mean, I already I already said that she has luminescent spores, so. <laughs> um, and we have one more. Uh, let's round it off with purify food and drink, because <laughs> uh, hear me out. There are funguses that can filter out or eat impurities out of water. So, you know, it, it makes sense. But you also have that, can we really trust this from her party members? When she's like, yeah, I, I purified this water for you. <laughs> All right. Um, with our spells chosen, I think mechanically all we have left is equipment. Uh, as a druid, we'll start off with a quarter staff, which is great because we can use that for shillelagh. Um, and because a quarter staff, so a quarter staff is one of those kind of weapons that uh, you can wield one-handed or two-handed, and they do different damage. Uh, quarter staff is a d6 normally one-handed and a d8 if you're doing it two-handed, uh, but shillelagh will let us do a d8 one-handed, so we still have a hand open for our wooden shield. Uh, and we also get leather armor as a druid. So this will give us a base armor class of 17. 11 from the leather armor, plus 4 from our dexterity bonus, plus 2 from the shield. Uh, we also get a druidic focus. Uh, I think I'm going to make that a flower pendant that she wears around her neck uh, from her time back when she was a non-zombie druid. Um, and I think that is everything mechanically so let's just finish out the story part of uh of Inalia uh by talking about how kind of I as a player would envision her story arc as well as a little bit uh of her a last little bit of her backstory um what Inalia does not remember is that she chose this life while I'd leave it up to the GM what exactly the Genesis arc is and why she needs to bring the spores there, and even why her mentor, Menathon, could not be the one to carry them there, what is true is that Analia willingly chose to become a revenant to carry out this critical mission. I would talk with the DM about having experiences throughout the campaign that would gradually help Analia to choose for herself to take the spores to the Genesis arc, and as she did so, she would come to remember that it had been her choice all along. A simple arc, but I think it would leave a lot of room for the DM to play and for the other characters to interact with her in meaningful ways. And with that, uh, Inalia Masian is complete and ready to play. A uh, big shout out to my wonderful wife, Lee, who's been kind enough to draw Inalia for us. And uh, I can't see how she's drawing now, but if we need to, uh, if. Uh, we, we might do some post-production finishing up of the picture, and I'll throw it up here for you to be able to see the final product. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Character Forge. Uh, let us know if you have any suggestions for how we can improve uh, the show, and or you know if you want to tell us something you liked about it. And we'll see you next time when we help a muscle wizard to cast Fist. Until then... Keep those forges lit.